Hi, my name is Nicholas Marachi and I'm a principal here at William Bar. I'm here with my colleague, David J. Brilli, Manager in Restructuring and Insolvency Division. And today I'm here to talk to you about some practicalities of tax consolidation and some things we see in the market. So first we're going to go through a case study to help us go through all these issues. HE Pennypacker Group, we'll call that Pennypacker. Cartwright is a wholesaler of homemade goods. Vanson sells furniture. The tax entities are all consolidated during 2018. Vanson grew quickly and Pennypacker sourced third-party debt finance to assist with the expansion. So as you can see in the structure there, we've got Pennypacker, wholly owned subsidiaries, Vanson and Cartwright, all in a tax consolidated group. Cartwright didn't require finance as it had strong cash reserves, as it's a strong trading business, and there are no tax sharing and funding agreements in place. So to just go back to the start again, let's talk about tax consolidation and get some basics right. So Pennypacker is the only visible taxpayer to the ATO, even though they're all separate legal entities, for tax purposes only, Pennypacker is the only taxpayer. Cartwright and Vanson don't lodge tax returns for the period that they're consolidated with Pennypacker, and the assets, liabilities, and businesses of all the entities are treated as one entity, and that being of Pennypacker. Pennypacker, however, this is the catch point, bears the primary responsibility for paying the debts to the ATO for all things income tax and PAYG in tax instalments, but things like PAYG withholding, GST, are always dealt with at an entity by entity level. But all group members are prima facie jointly and severally liable for tax liabilities of the head company, Pennypacker, during the period that they're members of the tax consolidated group. So what does that mean for Pennypacker? So for Pennypacker, should it have a liability to the ATO that remains unpaid, the ATO can technically, under ordinary tax consolidation rules, go back to Cartwright and Vanson to take care of the cash and follow up any outstanding liability that Pennypacker owes, even though the, the liability rests with Pennypacker. So what have we got to deal with this? So we've got a scenario that we can go through. Pennypacker defaults on paying its 22 tax liability with the ATO mainly driven by Cartwright's profits and there's a lack of cash. Cartwright is the only entity that has cash in the group, so the ATO is considering their action. So we've got these things called tax sharing agreements. During the membership period, joint and several li several liability of the group members can be shared on a contribution basis. What that means is that each tax member ca calculates their own tax liability and they effectively contribute that to the head company notionally and that way that their liability is limited by the amount of tax they effectively share to the head company. This means that their tax debt exposure is limited to their effective contribution to the group's debt. The catch point here again is that the agreement must be in place prior to Pennypacker lodging its tax return. If you get a tax agreement put in place after the lodgement, it will not be effective. Another good point to share on tax sharing agreements is that Upon the exit of the subsidiary, there's a true up of any tax liability that's owing between the group, effectively recouping any tax that's owed to or from the head company. Uh, once this happens, essentially the liability to the old group turns off. And if there's been an effective exit, the ATO has no recourse to the exiting entity. So for example, in this scenario, if Cartwright exited the group, um, paid all its liabilities due to the group in terms of tax contributed that through under the relevant agreements, the ATO could not come after it in two years' time in the event that Pennypacker had not paid debt. Tax funding agreements. This is the second prong. So we've got tax sharing agreements. We've also got tax funding agreements. Tax sharing agreements share the liability and contribute it among the group members. Tax funding agreements talk about how that tax liability is funded to and from the different parts of the group. Effectively, a lot of the times in the, in the consolidation process, we see this done through journal entries, but they become particularly important when we're trying to exit a group or where we're looking at things through a due diligence. Each subsidiary calculates their own standalone tax liability and they journal these up and down the chain. Each subsidiary, for example, if that subsidiary had a tax loss, that subsidiary shares that tax loss with the head company. Under the tax funding agreement, it also has a debit loan to that company, to the head company, because the head company is able to use that loss. If accounting standards are to be applied in terms of group consolidation and group reporting, deferred tax assets, deferred tax assets and deferred tax liabilities are able to be calculated and allocated amongst members of the tax group on a proportionate basis. 
and intergroup funding can be recognised. So Nick, as someone who comes from a different realm in the restructuring world, uh, when in practicality do you see tax sharing and funding agreements come into play most often? Yeah, good question. Uh, so practically, we like to think, some people like to think that these agreements are something nice to have in the background. Um, to a large extent, that's true. Uh, to a more important extent, that we've seen them come up really uh, in the due diligence space, so buy side and sell side. Yep. Um, we see them come up where people are trying to ascertain, okay, if they're buying a subsidiary, for example, and that subsidiary is leaving a consolidated group, the purchaser potentially wants to know, am I on the hook potentially in two years' time for liabilities of the old group? Yeah, that makes sense. There's obviously an inherent risk there yes. in terms of taking on liabilities when you don't know whether the uh, entity is on, actually on the hook with the ATO. Correct. Uh, and the second scenario is actually Dockers, so Deed of Company Arrangements. Uh, the, I'm quite familiar with those ones. Yes, yeah, so the so the in those arrangements where there's an arrangement for the debts to be dealt with and the entities to be effectively transferred or assets to be transferred, yeah. sometimes we can see that banks and other lenders are really keen to make sure that not only are ATO debts dealt with, that there's no other debts that could be effectively recouped from the exiting entity at the point that it's gone through the Docker process. Yeah, and often the, the whole point of the Docker process is to come out with a clean balance sheet so I can understand where your sophisticated creditors like banks will want to see tax sharing and funding agreements to ensure the, the slate is completely clean. Absolutely, yep. So we usually have to assist taxpayers in preparing the relevant exit forms under the agreements. So scenario B, we'll go to another scenario now. Uh, and this exemplifies the example that DJ just took us through. During 2023, Cartwright is sold to a third party and exits the group. What happens? So Penny Packer and Vance and stay in the tax consolidated group. The third party comes and buys Cartwright and Cartwright leaves the group. When this occurs, there's a different, there's a different process that applies. Penny Packer prepares exit allocable cost amount calculations as it is no longer part of the group. What these calculations do is that they push back up the cost base of the underlying assets of Cartwright onto its shares. This is to allow Penny Packer to calculate its cost base in the Cartwright shares. During the consolidation period, there is no cost base on those shares as the cost base is on the underlying assets of Cartwright. So what happens if Cartwright has a TSA or TFA, a tax sharing or tax funding agreement in place? It calculates its exit liability as it would. What do I owe the group when I exit? And it receives an exit from Penny Packer, an exit notice saying, this is what you owe. As long as those liabilities are set and they're dealt with before the exit and there's an exit notice issued by Penny Packer, once it's exited, Cartwright is off the hook and as DJ said, a clean slate in the event that someone comes and contests any consolidated debt. So on the flip side, what happens if Cartwright doesn't have any tax sharing and tax funding agreements? Firstly, we'd be a little bit nervous and potentially purchasers or the third party may start to get nervous. No exit payment or notice is required. It just exits the group. It gets transferred to the third party. In the future, should Penny Packer have owed liabilities for tax to the ATO for debts and some of those tax debts related for the period that Cartwright was a member, the ATO could always come back and pursue Cartwright, even though it's been out of the group for three years. To recap, Cartwright has exited, but Penny Packer owes money to the ATO for tax debts that arose for the period in which Cartwright was a part of the group. If those have remained unpaid and the tax sharing tax, frame, tax funding agreements were not in place, the ATO could always pursue Cartwright and there's no recourse. It's a big risk. Correct. And a lot of nervous transactions and there's been a lot of nervous negotiations around this point and sometimes it's not something that we see come up until the very last minute um, but it does give a lot of anxious parties a lot of things to worry about and some sleepless nights mm. so what is a valid tax sharing agreement so the commission has got very strong views on this uh, and he's got a lot of guidance around it this is something that where you typically get a lawyer to help you draft these and there's a lot of good templates um, always something to consider is whether that template works for you and, and always get legal advice on whether it's effective. But it must be in writing, always point one. It must be dated with the date of execution, it must be signed. So a lot of ones we see aren't signed, so that's a problem we see, so we've got to go get a signed one. It must specify the head company and, like, and the subsidiaries. And sometimes where subsidiaries enter the group after 
the forms have been executed, uh, you do it a deed of annexure to include that subsidiary in there. Um, so we've got to make sure that at any given time that that contract and that agreement, the tax sharing agreement, has all the relevant parties included and party to it. You obviously can't do these retrospectively, can you? No. So again, reiterating the point, uh, we can't go back and put these in place once we've lodged a tax return. If we're concerned about a liability that arises in a tax return, we have to have the tax sharing agreement executed before that. So what have we seen in this space? So share sales, as I mentioned before, may require these agreements to be put in place or have been cited by the purchaser. And this comes uh, back to warranties and purchase price. A lot of the time, if these don't exist, we'll see a whole bunch of warranties included in the agreement or to a last resort, the purchase price gets amended. Administration, as I mentioned before, is another important scenario we see these comes up. And then that's where there's a bank or a third party lender that really wants to make sure that the slate is clean. Uh, and then tax consolidation entry. So where a third party that is also a tax consolidated group acquires you, they'll want to make sure that any old liabilities have been dealt with, especially tax liabilities. Especially where there's commercial debt forgivenesses, we can see these come up where there's, for example, losses that existed, um, but there was intergroup debts and sometimes there's a forgiveness of those debts. So these agreements would show that in exit notices. And then banks, uh, ongoing lending, uh, loan covenants, things like that. Banks can request this and ensure that the group's up to date and the agreements are up to date and current. So Nick, do you have any tips and tricks for advisors and clients alike in their approach towards tax sharing and funding agreements? Yeah, absolutely. So it's pretty basic. It's always about looking at the detail. What should you do? And this is something we do all the time. Review that all clients that are or form part of a tax consolidated group, even if they have previously been part of a tax consolidated group, always obtain a request and retain them any tax sharing and tax funding agreements that are in place. Outline the benefits to your client and any of the group members in having these in place and what happens if they can't. Otherwise, engage help if nothing is in place. And as always, we always get involved in these and we always ask these questions about clients, any prospective clients, uh, and any time we're assisting clients that are in a consolidated environment, we're always asking questions about whether these are in place. If you have any questions or you need any assistance with tax consolidation, or you have any questions around the tax consolidated process, any of the documents, tax sharing, tax funding agreements, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or anyone at the William Buck team. Thank you for your time today, and hopefully you got something out of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you.